Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Saturday morning live. The date is, I don't even know. I should probably check these before we start. January 28th, 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Where are you coming in from? Tuning in from in the world. Let me know and we'll say hi in the comments. Jay, you made it first. Good to see you. Good to see you, my friend Jeremy Fifth. We'll just have a we'll have a running tally here. Um, third for Patrick. Who else? We don't have second or fourth. Oh, no, hang on. Elon, fourth. We're good. We're good. Well, it's good to see you all. I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to chatting, answering some questions, talking all things business, marketing, lifestyle, productivity, goal setting, success, money. I don't know. Whatever whatever you got. Anything that I'm qualified to uh, to talk about, I will. Anything I'm not qualified to talk about, I will. Um, I will just pass. I will let you know. I like to stay in my lane. I don't like to give advice on things that I have no experience in. So, Patrick, you got a couple questions today? My man, I'm ready. I'm loaded up. Coffee, good breakfast. It's going to be a good one. Let's grow. Good morning, Adam. Good morning. Let's grow. Good to see you. Ricky, there we go. There's second. David, I'm going to remember now. The armpit of the South. I don't think I could ever forget. That's like etched into my memory. It's good to see you though, buddy. Glad you could make it here. Dr. Andrea, good morning. Good to see you here as well. Diana, glad you could make it back. Good to see you this morning. Zach Tullier, Tullier we'll imagine. 10 a.m. in Texas. Good to see you, Zach. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of Texas uh, showing up here normally. So you're going to be well represented. We got, um, I think we got West Texas, Central Texas, all kinds of Texas. Uh, let's go. How hard is digital marketing YouTube channel from scratch? I don't know. Probably as hard as any other YouTube channel from scratch. Honestly, I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's any significant advantage or disadvantage to say choosing digital marketing. If that's where your passion is and that's what you're interested in, then yeah, it's no more challenging than any other channel. I think the key is, is to just start posting like what the videos that we make today are very different than when the channel was first started. So post your first video. Actually, I was going to make a poll. I totally forgot to make a poll. I was going to ask, I've got a, I've got a YouTube course that I had a couple of years ago, um, called the video brand builder. I need to re-record it. Like I've got to go through everything. I've been starting to piece it back together. I'm unsure if I'm going to launch it, mostly because I wasn't sure if there'd be enough demand to justify all the time and energy that I'm going to have to put back in it. But we will see because I'm, I'm a pretty big advocate and believer in YouTube as a strategy for basically everybody. We can talk more about that later though. All right, Patrick, Q1, when reaching out, hang on one sec. There we go. Much better. When reaching out for PPC clients, is it worth reaching out to them during their off season, like a landscaper during winter? Um, but they do indoor work as well. Well, if they do indoor work, then I wouldn't go. In, I'd argue that it's not their off season. Um, so yes, it's definitely worth reaching out to businesses any time of year. There, there's definitely an on season and an off season. An argument could be made for both cases. For example, if you reach out to them in their off season. They have more time. They're, they're more available to do it. Plus, if they're thinking about it, then they'll be prepared or, or sort of strategically planning for when they're going to get busy again. The kicker is they probably won't hire you until they start getting busy or that time of the year comes in. The other side is if it's their busy season, they're not going to be answering emails. They have more work than they know what to do with. They don't want more, um, more clients or whatnot. So yeah, reach out all the time, honestly. Uh, the phenomenal one. Hey, Adam, I'm 17 year old from Bulgaria. Good to see you here. Good for you for being here. Also, how can I find high paying clients? Because now I work with local fitness content marketing, but he pays me just 150 because the business is low budget. All right. Well, the way to attract high paying clients is, um, is th this is going to sound like bad advice, but bear with me. I'm going to explain the way to attract high paying clients is to be someone that high claim, high paying clients would want to work with. So if you're just getting started and you don't have the experience or the referrals or the testimonials or the case studies, it is going to be harder to attract high paying clients because they're going to want to see a proven track record of success. So your job at this stage is to get those track records. Yes, definitely start looking for higher paying clients. A lot of that has to do with the industry that you're in, like local gyms simply aren't going to be able to pay as much as local high-end car dealerships, for example, or, or uh, real estate or anywhere where there's going to be like a 10,000, 100,000 multi-million dollar purchase price. They're just, they're going to have a bigger budget. But yeah, your goal right now is to get case studies, testimonials, build your experience and expertise so you can leverage that. Later, Mafia King. Hi. Hi. Patrick, 
Oh, look at you. You're on, you're on a roll. We'll keep burning. When getting PPC clients for work, do you do month to month? Is it verbal agreement or do you write up a contract? Do you do longer three month agreements, six months, et cetera, et cetera? I have done all of the above. So I've done uh, verbal agreements, written agreements, month to month, three months, six months. Uh, I can tell you, so I'm going to tell you what I suggest you do. Then I'm going to tell you what I do. And there may be overlap there. Number one, I believe a written contract is mandatory, not uh, for any other reason, then it shows that you're professional and you know what you're doing and it also protects you and it protects them. So in your written contract, you're going to want like an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, where you're like, I'm going to tell you all my secrets. You're going to tell me all your secrets. We're not going to tell anybody else. That's that's the gist of it. There's a lot of places you can get these templates online for very inexpensive, 30, 50, 100 bucks, maybe at most to get like a full on uh, contract. Now, I like going month to month. The reason I like doing that is because it sort of makes the client feel a little more comfortable that uh, I'm going to be good at what I do, et cetera, et cetera. That said, here's how I phrase it. This contract is month to month. However, I like to set the expectation at the beginning that we're going to work together for at least three months, six months, whatever it is, because that's about the time that we're going to need. But if at any point during the relationship, either one of us decides that this just isn't for us, we're able to back out. And the reason that I put that, and instead of locking them into a six month contract, is because they can get out of the contract. Honestly, like they'll, they'll just get a lawyer. They'll just cancel it. Like, are you really going to chase them up? So I find the goodwill that I get by not locking them in, um, has paid off more than it hasn't. Other people do other ways. You do what works for you. Arlo Machado. Hey, buenos dias. Que tal, mi amigo? Ah, Mart Dobrerano. Mart. Good to see you, Martin. Glad you could make it here. Moritz, hey there, my friend, uh, Scholar Hype. Good morning from Zambia. Good morning. Good to see you here. Also, a lot of people tuning in from all different parts of Africa and Europe. Super international audience, which is amazing. Very cool. Uh, good evening from Germany. Good evening, Moritz. Uh, Vijito, hello. Just subscribed earlier today. It's good to have you. Good to have you as part of the uh Part of the team, part of the community. Gabriel, hi from Florida. Hi, Gabriel. Kevin, I tell ya, man, you've been consistent. Good on ya. Good on you. It's good to see you here again. Uh, who else we've got? We've got Ramat. Love your happy nature. Well, I'm glad to share a little bit of sunshine. It's uh it's actually super dark and cloudy here, so we'll have to internally generate our own happiness. The phenomenal one, our 17 year old from Bulgaria, how to reach out to more high budget clients as a single person and make the people take me serious and do not search for agencies. Again, this is going to be for anybody that's trying to attract better, higher paying, etc. clients, customers, etc. etc. is you, you do have to be a person worthy of their time and attention. This doesn't mean worthy as a, a person. You're good. We, we all know you're a, you're a valuable human, but, but like as a marketer, as an agency, as anyone that's providing a service, like you've got to look the part, dress the part, sound the part. Um, you've got to have those case studies. You've got to have those testimonials. Uh, you, you build them up slowly by working for free or for 150 bucks a month, like you said. And, um, and yeah, you, you slowly start to build up a solid personal brand brand around what it is that you do. Corporal Diesel, good morning from Central Texas. Good to see you, my friend. Unfortunately, my day job is conflicting with the stream, but I wanted to say hi. Looking forward to watching the replay. Ah, oh, that's all right. I'm glad you could make it. Thanks for tuning in and saying hi. It's good to see you. And yes, we'll catch you on the replay. Uh, Maritz, how do I find out about my customer's psychology and demographic? Ooh, number of ways. Um, first of all, oh, there's so many ways. Okay, so first things first. If you have not yet seen the latest video on the channel, it is how to do market research. For anybody watching the live stream now that has not seen this video, don't go watch it now. Hang out. Let's chat for a bit. But like after this is over, please go watch that video. It is a, um, it's a value packed video. It's like sometimes I have to make a video for, I don't want to say have to make a video for the algorithm, but like sometimes we cater a little more to the algorithm than I like, which is the benefit of having like um, a paid course where I can say the things that I want to say versus making videos that sometimes have to fit into the box that YouTube wants it to go to. So it actually gets promoted. This is not one of those videos. This is a video that needs to be seen and heard and internalized and understood. Um, it is not going to perform as well as like the clickbaity make a billion dollars overnight style video, but it is super important. So like I said, how to do market research. It's on the channel. You can't miss it. Go check it out. It's the latest one. That's step one. Step two, 
How do you find out for your existing customers? You, A, you ask them. That's by far the best way. So number one is you need to make a list of your customers, right? Get all of them out on an Excel spreadsheet, whatever it is, rank them from best to worst in regards to revenue, but you can also rank them in other ways. There's uh, there's something called a PVP framework, which stands for profit, um, value to the marketplace, personal fulfillment, how much you enjoy it. Uh, there's another framework called RFM. You can Google it later if you want. But the point is, you want to rank all your customers, you want to find your top 20% of them, and you want to look for similarities and characteristics. Do they have similar demographic, age, gender, income, occupation? Do they live in certain parts of the country or city or state or province? Do they have psychographic details? Do they like different things? Are they? Um, do they have different purchase intent? Are they buying your product or service to solve different problems? So asking them is one. Um, by far the best way. The second is to just simply take a look at whatever data you have on your customer uh, list. And the third way is to start collecting more of it moving forward so that you can find out those answers a little more clear. For example, one thing I do on a pretty regular basis is I'll run a survey. I'll ask you, I'll say, hey, where are you in your business journey? What's your biggest goal for this year? Start a business, get to 5K a month, get to 50K a month, get to 500K a month, get to 5 million a month, whatever it is. And that will show me the level that most of the audience is at. So I know how to tailor my content. So for example, the vast majority of, of people that typically show up um, and this is opposite of what I thought. I would have thought it was slightly more established, but there's a lot of new business owners, aspiring entrepreneurs, which is phenomenal, very exciting, but it makes me tailor my content so that I can provide value there instead of like how to scale your business from six to seven figures or seven to eight figures, where maybe I need to concentrate more on how to get that best idea, how to double down on the, um, the ideal offer, how to get to your first five figures, how do you, whatever it is. All right, let's see. Mavia King, I love web design, but I want a career in digital marketing. What do I need to do, Adam? Well, good question. You, my friend, have, hang on one sec. This is a, um, I've talked about this concept a lot before. It's, it's worth going over here. We're going to sketch it out lightning fast because it's the concept of a T-shaped marketer. And I think you're going to find it valuable if I can figure out how to get me on the screen and move things around and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. All right. <clears throat> marketing chat. So, I'm not sure if this is going to work well. We're going to we're going to make it fit. So I want you to imagine, of course, then the pen doesn't work. We might not be doing this after all. Incorrect password. These are those technical difficulties. All right, T-shaped marketer. There we go. We did it. Okay, so when it comes to digital marketing in particular, you've got all of these different things that you could do. So you've got like content marketing in this box. You've got SEO in this box. You've got web design in that box. You've got uh, email marketing in that box. You've got paid ads in this mar uh, box. You've got, I don't know, whatever else, direct mail marketing. Let's do, um, let's say we're going to go paid. Well, under paid ads, you've got Facebook ads, you've got IG ads, you've got YouTube ads, you've got analytics and tracking, you've got, my writing is even worse than usual because we're on an awkward angle, but I think you get the point. So what you want to do is when you want to move into digital marketing, you want to have a basic and broad understanding of like all of these areas, right? So you're going to be here with web design. But then you want to go deep in one specific area. So web design, your thing could be CRO, uh, conversion rate optimization. Your thing could be um, branding for web design. Your thing could be landing pages or marketing funnels or like there's an almost infinite amount of ways to like take your T and essentially go down. You could also combine it with like, I don't know, whatever would be a, a nice partner with web design, probably email. Because then if I could have a website that was designed to capture email addresses and then an email marketing campaign, you're kind of set. So that is the T-shaped marketer, incredibly important. Um, yeah, start, start looking at other areas of digital marketing. You don't need to master them all to begin with. You just need to start. Being here is a great place to start for the record. Uh, Zach Tullier, Tullier. Uh, Louisiana, so a bit French, so we'll say Tullier. I was running a successful photography company in Louisiana. I then moved to Texas and am now starting with zero clients again. What do you think is the fastest way to grow and get clients? Ah, awesome. Local networking. So number one, you're going to be able to port over all of the case studies, testimonials, all of the things that you did in Louisiana. Those are equally applicable to Texas. So your business is just moving and opening up a new location, a new division, a new arm, the, the Texas location. So all of your experience, all of that is still valuable. All you need to do now is essentially get out there. So because you're photography, which means in person, right? You got to take the pictures. Then yeah, local networking groups. Look for uh, like BNI, Business Networking International. I did this a decade ago and it was phenomenal. I still have friends to this day. My buddy owns um, 
an optometrist place. I went to see him yesterday and got glasses and contacts and all, all new things, literally from uh, a relationship and a friend that I made over a decade ago. So that's good. Look for like local chamber of commerce events. Look for local speaking things. You can run local Facebook ads if you want, but I don't think they're as powerful as just doing literal local networking boots on the ground stuff. So that's it. Michael, good day, Michael. Good to see you. And what is the best way to identify my client's psychology and demographics for my ad targeting? Oh, did you ask? No, someone else asked this. Moritz asked this as well. And Michael, good question. I might have to make another video on this one. So for starters, like I said really quickly, go check out that video on market research. It doesn't go into this deeply, so we can talk about it more. Um, but it will give you a pretty good overview of things you need to do. So in regards to uh, finding out what they are, again, you either have to ask them or you just have to look at the data. That's it. That's literally the only way to do it. So you speak to your best clients and you make a note of who they are, why they're buying it, what they're doing, what's the biggest problem that your product or service uh, or offer is solving for them. Those are going to give you pretty clear insights. You can ask them what other things they're into. What do they do for fun? Where do they hang out online and offline? What do they read? What do they watch? The best way to do it is to just have a relationship with your audience. For example, this live stream right here, though the intention is to give as much value as I possibly humanly can, I can't not understand and appreciate the things that I learn along the way. Where you live, what you're going through, what your biggest pains and problems are, where, um, what kind of things you like. All, all of these, these pieces of information that I'm collecting subconsciously and naturally just by having a conversation and a relationship with you here. That's it. So by being natural and authentic and showing up and having a conversation, I learn more about you every day, about what I can do to help, what other kind of content I need to create, where you're struggling that I can provide support for. Hopefully that helps. The other thing you can do, this is another idea. I don't love this one as much, but we'll, we'll talk about it, is you could just literally run a Facebook ad targeting different demographic or psychographic details and see which one performed better. And that'll, that'll give you a pretty clear indication of how things are doing. Okay, Patrick, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, what price point will be your YouTube training? Good question. I think if I launched it as a court uh, as a course, I'd keep it in the um, the hundreds. I think if I did it as like a full on workshop live over a period of weeks, it would have to be in the thousands. But I don't think I'm going to do that because I think I can deliver most of what I want to in the form of a course. So think hundreds, not thousands. Jerson, what's the best way a marketing specialist and a sales rep can work together? Uh, this again, it's funny. This is going to sound trite and trivial, but it's uh, it's probably the best advice I can give you, which is to like literally sit down and have a discussion with with each other about what each other wants. So I can tell you already what the sales rep wants, but it's like they want sales qualified leads, SQLs. Um, so you're going to have to talk to them and be like, what's a good qualified lead for you? What, what kind, what can I do to make your life easier? Do you want them in the form of email? Do you want them in the form of SMS? Would it help if we initiated a conversation for going the other way? Um, the sale, the marketer could be like, look, sales guy, here's what I need from you. You need to tell me which leads are doing well, which ones are not. Do they need more warming up? Do they convert? Do they not convert? Uh, if we're tracking different channels, which ones are giving the best qualified leads? Which ones are giving the best sales close percentage? Conversation. Communication, that's that's the secret here. Hey Adam, what's your process with a company as a marketer look like? What's happening behind the scene when you work with another brand uh, creating content? Yeah, good question. So my process, uh, and again, it's gonna depend on the services that you offer. So because I don't, because the marketing agency is like basically closed to new clients, uh, the only thing, the most recent thing that I offered that I don't really offer anymore is consulting. So when I do consulting with a client, the very first thing I do is I run them through the marketing master plan every time without fail. If you've not seen this yet, um, it's here. It's literally model, market, message, media, machine. And I, I check all of those boxes. So what's your business model? What's your offer? What's your price point? What are your packages? Um, where's your highest margin products and services? What do you want to sell more of? What do you want to sell less of? Where do you want to transition to? Everything that I can learn about them. Then I move on to market. Who's your ideal target market, your ideal customer avatar? What are their demographic details? Age, gender, income, occupation, etc. Geographic details. Where do they live? City, state, province, etc. Psychographic details. Do you know their attitudes, their interests, their values, their political affiliations, their religious leanings, their their, um, their organizations or groups that they're a part of, everything that I can gather on their, 
customers I want because I use that for the message, which is trying to figure out their miracles and their miseries. Their miracles are their wants, their dreams, their goals, their desires, their miseries are their pains, their fears, their frustrations, their nightmares, all the things they're trying to get away from. Your business, your offer, or your clients, its job is to serve as the bridge between miseries and miracles, to take them away from this terrible state that they're in right now to the promised land on the other side of this magical bridge. Then I go media. What uh, what platforms, what channels, where are they active, present, online, because then we're going to go there, ignoring everything else. And then the machine. This is going to be the marketing funnel, the customer journey. How do we engineer it? What is the one that they're currently using? Where are the gaps or the holes that need to be plugged? What, uh, what can I add to different places in order to increase conversion rate at different steps? That's it. Which I appreciate. I just ranted all that off in like two minutes. It's obviously a lot more work than that, but that's the framework. And then if you do it for enough years, it becomes second nature, just like that. And that's literally what I do every time. Solopreneur, brand new creator, billion dollar empire. Exact same. Hassan, hey Adam, I need to know your thoughts on service upsells, starting with low ticket to hire one. Uh, my thoughts, fine. Good enough, right? Like let's use, I don't know, an oil change. You go in for an oil change and while you're there, they're like, hey, do you also want us to shampoo your car and clean the interior and it's only this much and this much and replace your windshield wipers and yeah i think upsells are great and they're helpful and uh and they'll allow you to capture up to 50 to 100 percent more revenue just by offering something that 20 percent of the people are going to want to take so i'm cool with that uh if it doesn't work with your business model you can also offer downsells and cross sells selling something less expensive or a complementary product to it i think they're valuable though if that's what you want to do Ubani, good to see you, my friend. I uh, hope you're doing well for 2023. So far, so good, my man. So far, so good. Now I have this question. What would you do when you want to be creative but can be stuck? Like making a music video, um, but you want more out of it, but. So essentially, what do you do when you stumble into a creative block? What, what happens when you're just, you're out of ideas? Which happens, for the record. Even, um, even yours truly here. I, I get creatively stuck sometimes and I was like I don't know what to do uh what do I do I do things that inspire me to be creative so probably the first thing that I'll do actually I've got two processes number one is I'll consume more creative content there's um there's different youtubers that I'll watch that are in different niches different industries uh I just enjoy their content I think it's really well done so I'll watch that and it'll sort of amp me up again I'll be like oh man that's cool that's a cool shot that was a cool story that was a neat transition I like how they did that voiceover like there's there's things that I'll get ideas from. That's one. Number two is I'll often sit down and just grind through it anyway, knowing that the creativity and the inspiration is going to come later. So for example, if I have to write, um, write out some bullet points or a script or something like that, and I'm just feeling fried, I'll sit down and I'll write it. And, uh, the first hour it might be garbage, just literal garbage, but then I'll have an idea. And, uh, and even if I walk away with just like one decent idea, I can make all the difference and I'll, I'll come back to it later. So yeah, time in the seat, time just spent sitting there doing the thing and also um, taking on more creative inspiration. Jeremy, what kind of camera do you use for videography? I use almost exclusively uh, Sony A6400s. Amazing little camera, like pound for pound, dollar for dollar. It's hard to argue with them. So for those of you uh, familiar, not familiar uh, with like full frame versus APS-C cameras, there's a lot of debate of like typically full frame cameras are considered the, the professional industry standard ones. But man, oh man, I saw a lot of people make some pretty good videos with APS-C style cameras, a slightly smaller camera, and the quality was like as good and nobody could really tell the difference. It's smaller, they're cheaper. So I've got a couple of them that I basically always keep around. They're easier to use on a gimbal. So for example, this guy here. So this is a, I wonder if it'll focus. This is um, a Sony a6400. It's using a Sigma 16 millimeter lens. The lens is actually going to be the thing that gets you a higher video quality than the camera itself. Most cameras are capable of shooting 4K now anyway. So the lens is going to be the factor. Uh, F1.4 means it can work in low light and it gives you this like sharp look on my face and then kind of creamy blurry look in the background. And then I can stick it on this gimbal, which isn't light, but isn't ridiculous. And it allows me to have super stabilized shots if I never, ever need to do anything like that. Other than that, as I drop it, other than that, I've got a couple of Canon cameras that never come out. I've got a GoPro that I rarely use, a DJI Mavic Air drone that also rarely gets used. What else? I think that's it. So Sony a6400, 16 millimeter or 30 millimeter lens is my preference. Carlo. <laughs> 
<laughs> I read and then I cough. There we go. I'm trying to trying to shrink it down here. Hang on. There we go. As a marketing coordinator managing 13 SaaS companies, software as a service, for those not familiar, how do you recommend I delegate for SEO? I don't have time to write all the articles, even with chat GPT. Should I go to freelancers? And the answer is yes. Obviously, if you're managing um, 13 companies that are doing SEO, then yeah, you, you definitely want to delegate certain tasks. So your job is essentially you're the, uh, you're the conductor. So you stand up there. You have the vision. You have the idea you have the strategy, you know all of the parts. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions people have as well when I give that analogy is they think that they don't need to know how to play the trumpet and the oboe and the French horn or what it should sound like or like you need to know what all those parts are. Remember back to the T-shaped marketer? You don't need to be an expert in them, but you better know what, what a French horn sounds like compared to a trombone, right? I don't know. I don't know if this analogy is panning out, but but stick with me. So you've got to know where they all go and then you're going to synchronize them accordingly. So I want my SEO writer to write a thousand words on this topic. I want this person to respin that article so I can reuse it without getting dinged for um, duplicate content. I want this person to do on page. Yeah, very much. You're, you're going to move the chess pieces around. Uh, good luck. What do you think about YouTube automation? Is it worth it to do it? Yeah, YouTube automation is a fascinating subject. I um, I watched like, I don't know, a good couple dozen videos on YouTube automation strategies. So again, if you're not familiar, what YouTube automation suggests is you go out there and you hire somebody to write you a video script. You hire somebody to do a voiceover for the video script. You hire somebody to find B-roll and to edit the whole video. And then you put it on YouTube and you make passive income. Uh, there's some channels that are doing this phenomenally well. There's some channels that I guess you could also call them faceless YouTube channels because the person doesn't show their face on it. So I've got multiple thoughts. The first thought is it's harder than it sounds. So if, if you're looking at it as like a get rich quick, easy side hustle, I think you'll be mistaken. I think what you find is that the people that are successful, they have, they've gone through like 10 different YouTube automation channels before one finally stuck. So there's that. The second thing is my thought is, is especially actually I've got multiple thoughts. Other thing, anytime that we have something like attention arbitrage where we're buying something cheap and we're selling it for more expensive, the second that people find out that it works, it gets saturated and flooded. So there, it's harder to be differentiated if you're doing the same thing as everybody else. Are there still niches that are underserved that you can rank for? Yeah, totally. But they'll become saturated quick enough when people realize. So there's that. The third, fourth, I don't even know what we're up to. Uh, I see no reason not to gain a significant competitive advantage by just showing your face. So my suggestion is, if you're going to do a YouTube automation channel, number one, pick a niche that is not only profitable, but also that you're interested in. So find something that you like, I don't know, tech. You can still outsource the scripting, um, maybe some of the voiceover, though I'd probably do that yourself, and all of the editing. You could definitely do that. But you probably want to rework the script a little bit, and you, um, you, you want to show your face a little bit, and I think you'll get a better lift that way. I've not done it, mostly because my focus is here on this channel. Ooh, but I've thought about it. It's fascinating. But, I'm, but I'm, I think it's one of those shiny objects that I'm going to stay away from. Diana, what does a good onboarding process look like? Yeah, a good onboarding process. That's a good question. It's um, it's one that allows you to frame the relationship in the right way as the expert. So it's one where you're going to go to the client and you're going to lay out whatever it is that you need. So the best onboarding process is, is totally unique to you and your business and the clients that you work with. But essentially, it's going to involve collecting the necessary data and information that you need to do your job well in a way that is the easiest and least unobtrusive, the least obtrusive, to your target market. So if I can give you a nice, simple, to easy fill out form, if I can start with a kickoff call where we have a quick conversation for 20 minutes and I get all the information I need and I record the conversation so I can transcribe it or review it later, uh, if I can collect all of the data for once, if I can set up automatic payments so we don't have to worry about that. Yeah, over the years, my onboarding process evolved to where it was like, basically someone would fill out an application, it would get filtered through my team if it was a good fit for me. If it was, we'd schedule a 15 minute call. During the call, I'd figure out their goals and whatever. If I felt it was a good fit, I'd extend an invitation. If they said, yes, that sounds great, let me in. Then I would, let me see if I remember this right. I would send them over the contract to be fill, um, signed using DocuSign or eSign or any uh, sign now, any online document thing. Then I would send them a payment link where they were able to put in their credit card details for automatic payments. And then we would set a kickoff, kickoff call right away after that. And then we'd set up our regular meetings. That was it. 
All right, Craig, Adam, do you have any books or resources you can recommend for learning SEO? Yeah, good question. And resources, the interwebs and YouTube and Google are going to be your best bet opposed to books. And the reason is I love books for like 99% of things. Um, in fact, even maybe the basics of SEO, like a book might be okay. But the problem is, is that it just changes so quickly. So there's Google's Panda and Penguin and Hummingbird and like all of these animal uh, algorithm changes that influence how links are tracked, how content is measured and evaluated, uh, what works now that didn't work even a few months ago. So it's, it's constantly evolving, but the basics, once you learn them, I mean, you kind of learn them, right? So, and the basics are pretty simple. It's going to be like on-page optimization, the URL, the headings, um, basic H1, H2, H3 tags, body copy, meta description, off-page ranking is also relatively simple to understand. It's basically just link accumulation, uh, but how you go about that is another story. Uh, the good plan there is to learn the different softwares, Ahrefs, uh, SEMrush, Moz, Majestic. Yeah. Major Explorer, hello there, Wanderer. Hello. I'm stationary right now, but I'm wandering in a couple weeks, so I'll be tuning in from another location. Jason. Good to see you, Jason. I own a rage room in Midland, Texas, another Texas. Excellent. And need some ideas to entice people to sign my, uh, sign up for my Facebook lead magnet ad. I was thinking either $20 off discount code or $20 gift card, which is better. Other ideas. Yeah. Fascinating. This opens up all kinds of different conversations about what's better 10% off or $10 off. The, the fact is, is it depends on the price of the object. So if it's $100, $10 off sounds better than 10% off. So you're probably better going there. If it's um, a really, pardon me, I think I might have said that wrong. Bear with me. If it's a $200 item, well, we can work through this together. We can work through this together. If it's a $200 item and you say 20% off, it's going to sound a little better than say $20 off or, or $40 off, but it's going to depend on your market and their understanding of the price point of the thing. So play around with it and you could probably test both and see which one does better. That's probably my recommendation is to put both of those out there. Now in regards to getting more people to actually sign up for it, I think we could do better, right? Than a simple discount. It's never been my favorite strategy to just discount our offers because then you tend to attract people that are only going to be interested because it's cheap. What I'd rather do is find out what's compelling about it. Maybe it's bring a friend. Maybe it's buy one, get one free. Maybe it's a limited time offer to get, I don't know much about rage rooms, but like, I don't know, an extra chair or TV or something like that. Um, or like whatever else you can do to think about to sort of incentivize someone to do it. But again, it's funny because a lot of it's going to come down to uh, to just basically testing this out. It's funny now that now that we talked about that, my brain is not going to settle until I can remember what it was. So I'm going to give you a resource. Da -da -da -da. It's by Nick Kalenda. Pricing. Hang on one sec. I'm going to see if I can spell it right. N i c k k o l e n d a, and then pricing. And he has amazing pricing uh, tactics and strategies and so on and so forth. I'm going to just drop it way in the bottom of the chat and then I'm going to have to like scroll my way all the way back up to where we were. But take a look at that because that's going to give, basically give you an idea of the different price things. But again, I don't think that's going to be the best plan for you anyway. All right. Where do we go? Do, 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 Zach. Should we, do we have another one? Hang on. It's a follow-up. Should I try to crack the code on those channels or try something like Google ads? Yeah, probably Google ads. Um, you can try to crack the code, but I don't think you need to because you're locally targeting anyway. So the code's not that hard to crack. Whereas with Google ads, you're going to get people who have search intent and are actively searching for what you have to offer. But again, local networking. Okay, we answered that one. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Where are we? Bruce, good morning from Denver. Good morning, Bruce. Diana, what are your musts you recommend having ready before reaching out to clients? There's so much to learn and I keep taking all it all in, but not taking action yet. So yeah, um, it's funny. My recommendation is probably just go reach out to clients and let them know where you're at. That's really it. Just be like, hey, I'm learning. I'm at this stage. Like you're going to learn by doing more than you will by like studying and taking in information. You have to do that for sure, but you're already doing that. Right. And that's not the obstacle anymore. It's like, Diana, we've been talking here for 
refresh my memory, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, like it's been a while, right? Um, and if you've been studying actively that whole time, you have you have the baseline knowledge of going out there and probably getting half decent results for a client, which is what they're after, especially if you don't charge them anything or much at all. So yeah, get a client, tell them where you're at, tell them you, you want experience and a referral and a testimonial if you do a good job, they can pay for the ads and then you, uh, you run them through the process. Raheem, good morning from, I can't see the flag, Pakistan maybe? I'll have to squint. I can make it bigger, but we'll go with that. Uh, where to start from taking clients' social media? I'm not sure I fully understand. Where to start taking clients from social media? Yeah, f rephrase that one for me if you could, and I, I could be able to give you a good answer. Maxwell, hello, opening a chiropractic clinic, created avatars, doing video shorts daily, but how exactly are we going to get customers through the door? Should we use Facebook ads? So you're opening up a chiropractic clinic, created avatars, doing video shorts daily, but how are we going to get customers through the door? Should we use Facebook ads? Okay, so chiropractic clinic. This is gonna be the same for uh, a dentist office, um, anything local, um, the rage room as well. What else? Who else did we have? Any other kind of local based business that we need to get people into? Photography as well. Essentially, content creation is good for sure. You have to do that. So daily shorts, fantastic. Maybe start thinking about longer form videos as well. That'd be my recommendation. It's probably the best way to secure your long term future in the world of business. Long form video. Um, as far as getting clients in the door right now, Google ads are really good because you're going to have somebody with search intent. So if you can put together a really compelling Google ad, free initial consultation, whatever it is, and that becomes your ad, it sends them to a landing page, you collect their data, you follow up with them, ideally through a phone call, that's going to be your highest, uh, your highest closing vehicle. I get all excited and I start ranting and I forget to breathe and swallow and just run out of air. Those are going to be your best plans for sure. The other thing you can do is start working on optimizing your Google business page. Um, like start optimizing it now. If you don't already have one, get one, get it verified, get as many testimonials as you can, get those five-star reviews. Try to start getting citations and links back to it using a service like White Spark or Bright Local. Facebook ads, fine. Sure, Google ads will probably be better other than brand new opening, offering this thing, possibly also have an op um, like a meet and greet kickoff party and then also local networking, BNI, Chamber of Commerce, other local networking groups, phenomenal. Gabrielle, what trends do you expect to see for in influencer marketing over the next year? Yeah, I don't, good question. I don't think I'm going to see a change in the direction that it's going. I think it'll just continue to be refined more. So more and more brands are going to continue reaching out to influencers, but I think the brands are going to get smarter with the influencers that they choose to work with. And I'm, I'm hoping that the influencers also start getting better at aligning themselves with better brands. So we saw a couple really disastrous things happen last year with um, in the finance space. Fortunately, it's not my niche, but I know a lot of people in that where they were sponsored by a pretty sketchy company that then went completely bankrupt. No fault of their own, but they're still associated with that and that's on their reputation. So that's not fun. So I think they're gonna get better at that. Um, but also I think finding better ways to track and to measure and to build possibly longer term brand collaborations with different brands. So personally, I'm working with significantly less brands but better brands, at least in my view, brands that I think are more beneficial to you and to me and ones that I use every single day. So high level is one that I'm a huge fan of and HubSpot. So between HubSpot and high level, I feel like most of your marketing bases are covered in regards to training and software and things like that, uh, which has been my personal preference for, for brands that I choose to work with. All right, Ahmed Mamoon. Hello, Adam. Do you have any tips for someone who hasn't studied marketing in university? Yeah, the first of which is to um, to accept the fact that you don't need university to study and to master marketing. I went to school to study marketing, went to college to get a marketing degree, but it was not necessary. And in hindsight, I probably could have done as good or much better um, on my own. But again, it, for me, it was kind of like an easy way to just make sure that I was accountable to actually doing the things that I needed to do. But like 99% of my knowledge during school came outside of school hours, listening to audiobooks on the way to class, reading marketing books in between class. I was a bit of a nerd. I liked marketing. So it was like anything I could do. And then as soon as I graduated and finished school, that's when the education begins. It's kind of a cheesy quote, but it's really true. It's like, that's where I learned everything. That first year or two out of university, taking on clients, doing client work, writing campaigns, 
um, having awkward meetings, trying to explain like what I was doing and why it was valuable and the benefit I was bringing, being challenged on every single decision that I made and having to be accountable to it. Man, I grew more in that first couple of years than, um, than any, any school gave me. Moritz, my pleasure. Glad you, where you got there. Uh, Moritz, okay, I think you're answering there, so we'll let you guys chat. Chris, morning, bro. Morning, buddy. There's a dude on Instagram posing as you're just an FYI. Yeah, that's not new. It's a, what a bummer. What a weird world. Um, yeah, that's not new. They're, they do this all the time. I don't know what it is. They, they go, I'm not very active on Instagram as well. So maybe that's one of the things, but like they go to my profile, they download all of my photos, they put them on their own account and then they start messaging you and everybody and pretending it's me. So it's not me. Um, I don't just send cold emails, especially like cold emails. I was like, Hey, Chris, Adam here. Want to buy some random crypto? Send me all your money. I was like, if you ever get something like that from someone claiming to be me, it's not me. So yes, I appreciate that. If you can just mark it as spam or fake or whatever it is, that'd be huge. And we'll try to get it shut down again. But they're like, they're like freaking whack-a-mole. Every time we just like smack one down, they, another pops up. Same thing happens with YouTube comments where you'll see things be like Adam Earhart, Telegram, WhatsApp, message me for this. I was like, that's never me. That's not me either. I, I try to stay on top of those a little more, but hilarious stuff. Nigel, love the show. Oh, I love that you love the show. Thanks, Nigel. Good to see you here, buddy. Uh, Patrick, Q3. Oh, I get what you're saying. Question one, question two. I thought you were talking about like quarters in the year. As a BBC noob, what is a must-have on my website when I don't have a client yet? Last question. Well, hey, you keep them coming. I'll see if I can get to them. Uh, what's a must-have if you don't have a client yet? <sighs> I would suggest, like, first of all, obviously a bio about you, putting your face on that, showing that you're the person behind it is going to go a lot better. It's funny when I see a, a marketing agency site that's like, we're a big flashy agency and we're too important to put our faces or to show who we are. I was like, man, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Like you need your face on there because if you're not big or established or famous yet, you need to show that there's a person behind what you're doing that's going to be responsible for the campaign. So put your bio on there. Remember, write it in the way that's in the benefit of your client. Like it's not about you. It's actually about them. So there's, t there's a tip. But the second thing is also try to get a client or get a referral or get a testimonial. If you can't get a testimonial about the work you've done, get a testimonial about your personality. So find a previous employer, uh, a former teacher, someone being like, Patrick is like one of the most honest, upstanding people you'll ever meet. Highly recommend working with them. Something like that. It doesn't have to say anything in regards to your services yet, but it's it's an, um, uh, what do I say? A uh, Basically a recommendation of your personality. Diana, from your previous experience with gyms, what would you say are the top strategies to help them closing leads and keeping them? So the best strategy to keeping someone is to provide an amazing service. That's it. Remind them why they're there. Remind them why you're good. Remind them of the benefits they're getting. Have a good follow-up. Have a good customer uh, journey, good experience, all of those things. Um, best way to close leads, I've talked about this. I talk about this each time, but like, honestly, this is it. So when a lot of people do lead gen, they go and they generate the lead, they dump it onto the business owner's plate and the business owner who's busy ignores the lead or does a terrible job at following up. And then they come back to you and they're like, Diana, these leads are garbage. They're terrible. Nobody answers their phone. Nobody writes back to their email. I was like, cool. When did you follow up with them? And they're like, I called them within a couple days. I was like, bah, wrong answer. Five minutes, max. It's like, you can Google this as well. I forget the exact stat, but it's like, you can watch the lead closing ratio, like fall precipitously off a cliff, the longer time between when the lead fills out the form and when, uh, when somebody follows up with them. That's why I like high level. Uh, this thing, this is my new my new mini site that I just built, it's super basic, but, but it gets the job done. So if you go here, you can register for a free training on how to use all of the software and then also get a link to uh, an extended free trial on it. I would just use the snapshot for gyms in there. So get a lead, put them through this, ideally with SMS marketing, follow up, deliver that lead directly to the client, your gym owner's phone, and then have them uh, follow up right away. Send them, start a conversation, get them going. That's the secret. Chat GPT, good tool for marketers or bad? Well, certainly not bad. Um, good if you use it right. So good if you use it for idea generation to, um, to help you sort of get the creative juices flowing. Um, I guess bad if you like copy and paste everything directly and just put it in because then it's not original. It's not, typically it's pretty generic, uh, but it's, it's pretty cool. I like it. I play around with it on a regular basis, but I certainly wouldn't 
put all of my faith in that bad boy. Diana, do lookalike audiences make sense for lead gen post iOS 14? Yes, and the reason is, is because you can do a lookalike audience off a meta source, not just a your source. So I would probably, actually you can still do it. Like you could still make a lookalike off your email list or your website traffic. I don't anymore. I do them mostly off of meta sources like engage with content, watch the video, etc. Genetic Media, hey, glad I caught you live again. Good to see you, Jen. Glad you could make it. So far, every Saturday at 8 a.m. I'm going to see how that goes. I'm going to be doing a bit more traveling in, uh, in the next bit again, but um, I'll find a time. We'll find the time. Good luck. How can you... Oh, hang on. There we go. How can you learn a skill since I always find the fundamentals, but I don't know what to learn after? Well, the fundamentals are the most important. Like, you can learn... Um, you can get 80% of the success by learning those, like, 20% core fundamentals. So for marketing, it's targeting, segmentation, positioning, differentiation. It's uh, it's copywriting. It's understanding how to craft an offer and a message. It's understanding this bad boy here of the marketing cheat sheet, going through the marketing master plan. It's like once you've mastered those, which for the record, it's like that old expression, takes, um, what is it? A minute to learn, a lifetime to master. That's very much it. Like you've got to learn these things, but then mastery takes forever. I'm still mastering different things. I'm still studying Every single day, I watch videos, I take courses, I have mentors, I have colleagues and friends in marketing, I talk to them, uh, I never stop. Like I'm, I'm always trying to learn more and more and more about well, why is this working? Why is that not working? What's what's up with YouTube shorts? Why, why, is, why are those changing? Should we loop the outro? Should we not loop the outro? What's a good thumbnail look like? How do we structure an email campaign? Like, yeah, you just never stop. And then just let your, your curiosity guide you. Sounds like a Jiminy Cricket quote. Pinocchio style, but like literally learn the fundamentals then be like, Hey, what sounds interesting? Copywriting. That sounds interesting. I'm gonna learn copywriting. And then you start going down that path. And then once you learn copywriting, you'll be like, Hey, how do I get my copy in front of people? So you'll learn social media or email or whatever it is. Major Explorer group. How y'all doing today? I can't speak for the, can't speak for the tribe, but I'm, I'm doing good. Thank you. David, as a marketer, how do you convince a customer who has already showed dissatisfaction in your product? I don't think you do. Um, so I've got a couple thoughts. Number one is you preach to the choir. So you only really sell to people that already get it. I don't ever try to convince somebody that they should like something that they don't because why? There's enough other people out there that are going to like it. Now, if they're dissatisfied with your product, then what you have to do is you've got to figure out why and what you can do to fix it. That's really it. Ask them, honestly. Hey, what did you not like about this? And they'll be like, it was too slow. And then you can be like, what if I made it faster? And they'll be like, that would be awesome. And then you make it faster. Ah, oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Ox Dior. I'm doing lead gen and appointment setting for solar sales team. Awesome. I like it. Um, think it's more effective to run ads under the sales team brand or create my own brand and just funnel the leads over to the teams. Depends on your long-term goals. Like if you want to just do it for them and their business alone, then yeah, run it under them and their business alone. And now you're tied there. If you want to start taking on other solar lead companies, you can run it under different, uh, like under your own brand name. I'd probably still have, oh, this, this, this is going to get a little complicated, but it's like, there's a lot of ways you could structure this, including separate ad accounts for each um place that you're generating leads for, you can run them all under your own ad account and then just divvy them up accordingly. You could, if they're all in a similar area, you could generate the leads and then round robin them to different places. There's a lot of ways to go. What would I do? What would I do? I would run ads under whatever name is going to sound like the most relevant to solar leads. So for example, if my agency name was like lead gen 101, I would never run ads under that name because people ain't going to click it. And they're going to be like, I don't know, that's not a solar thing. I'd run ads under like best solar New York city or whatever it is. It's like, then, then I'd run ads under that. Top tips to improve Google, my business pages. Very simple. Two things. Number one, fill it out as completely as humanly possible. Three things actually. So I'm talking name, address, phone number, pictures, reviews, full descriptions, hours. Keep that thing updated regularly. If it allows you to put up posts and updates, do it. I want that thing loaded. Like, loaded. Tip number two, build citations to that Google business page. So Whitespark, Bright Local, online citation building services, you can find them. Uh, the Hoth is another one, H-O-T-H. Uh, tip number three, NAP, name, address, phone number. You need to have a consistent spelling in the name, the address, and the phone number, the way it's formatted, all of that across all of your social plant channels, your website, everywhere. You do that, you're, um, 
You'd be surprised how quickly that will rank. Altamesh, hey Adam, I got my first client for doing social media marketing. Good man. Thanks for your videos. Hey, good. Good for you. Uh, so they basically run offline music classes. What should be my strategy? Okay, so they run offline music classes. So first of all, you're gonna have to figure out who their target market is. They're like, I'm gonna guess here based on having kids and having done music lessons my whole life. Um, you're probably targeting moms who have kids who want to do music. So what I would do is I'd run Facebook ads locally targeted, targeting moms, very easy to do. So you go parents with children between the ages of X and X or whatever it is, target pretty much only females because they're the main buyers of this. And then try all different kinds of ad copy and creative and see which one gets people to click. You're going to need a good offer. So starting soon, limited enrollment, brand new course on piano or music for young children or whatever it is. But yeah, that's cool. I like it. Elon, Adam, thanks so much. I watch your vids during school and teachers think I take notes on their lessons while I'm learning from you. Valuable and entertaining. Continually appreciate and thankful. Well, that's funny. I, I would like to say pay attention in school, but yeah, I, as someone who went through school to do it, I learned significantly more from my mentors and coaches than I ever did from class. So do what you got to do to get good grades. But yeah, you're, you're going to learn more on your own, whether it's through me or through um, any uh, anybody else that you follow. <clears throat> Water break. Hang on. Smash the, that's my, my, um, like button call to action. I need like a video. Smash the like button, please. While we, while we sip water. <clears throat> All right, we're good. R.L. Machado, I self-publish low content books on Amazon. For anybody not familiar, low content books are typically journals, coloring book, things that the person will fill out themselves. Travel guides or travel journals, I should say, um, it's a neat model for the record. My shop is on Facebook where people can click a link and it redirects to the Amazon listing. Do you think any, do you have any Facebook ad tips? I think Amazon doesn't allow the pixel. Yeah, Amazon and Facebook don't play great together. I, I've got two thoughts. Number one is I would start focusing probably more on Amazon ads. You like, if you can crack that one, you're going to get better results than sending people off the site onto another site. The other option you have is running Facebook ads, but giving them a free lead magnet or free like sample page, getting them onto your email list, using your email list to then send them over to Amazon. But that's a bit of a convoluted roundabout way where I would just say double down on the main platform uh, of Amazon. Jason, my rage room man, is SMS or email better for lead magnet? Email is, wow, goo, I almost said that without context. So I use email and the reason I use email is because SMS isn't as good for my business because I'm not local and I've got a better response rate with email and a higher opt-in rate with email. And you're going to find the same. SMS is better for response rate, for conversations. Um, so my advice for basically all local style businesses is SMS. My advice for even many national businesses is SMS. It used to be like 90% email and 10% SMS. That's shifting a little. It's still not 50, 50. I'm probably still like 60, 40, 70, 30 email uh, for you SMS and do this because it's free and try it out. It's not free if you decide to stick with it, but do the 30 day free trial. They'll have snapshots in here as well. You may or may not find one. You, you definitely won't find one for a rage room, but you'll find one for like a local service business or coaching or something else that you'll be able to just do a few swaps over for. Um, but I would run my lead magnet or my offer through this into an SMS. Then I deliver the goods I might even try to schedule a phone call if I could with them after or put some kind of appointment thing on it so I could have a chat with them. Leonardo Maya Pugliese, hello from Hempstead, the Netherlands. Hello, Leonardo. Good to see you here. Mafia King, thank you, Adam. My pleasure. My pleasure. Elon Bar, hey, Adam. How things are with try building? Is there a Discord? Oh, yeah, Discord server on the way. Yeah, good question. There's, oh, man, there's not yet. So, fun story. A long, a long time ago, few months ago, um, I was tr testing out like this new community software to build one on another server. I didn't love it. Uh, it's since, but it was okay. But it's since got bought by Kajabi, which is my main coast course hosting software. And, um, and I'm debating, I haven't figured out. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not totally committed yet. Um, but putting it on there, I'm not against the idea of a discord server, but I also would like something where there's it doesn't quite work as well as I want for what I'd like it to do. So there may be a community at some point where everybody can just go and chat. I'll pop in there randomly. 
Um, but possibly. Thank you for the reminder. You just keep poking me at it and I'll, we'll see. Maybe, maybe. The last thing I want to do though is like build up a huge thing and then shut it down because it didn't turn out how I wanted. So I want to make sure. Jared Castranova going into a job interview for B2B content marketing position. What are some trends or goals I should focus on that are timely for a brand that has some good content, but has room to grow? Good question. B2B content marketing trends. So if you're going to apply for a job or anybody doing B2B content marketing, business to business, first of all, all marketing is kind of content marketing. So we're going to be creating stuff and sharing it. The trends right now are very much short form vertical video. Um, even in B2B, often it gets associated with B2C companies on like TikTok and people selling like makeup or gum, chewing gum or like random stuff like that, but it's still very applicable for B2B. Um, my best advice is to pair short form vertical video with longer form video, horizontal right now at least, uh, because that's going to give you the best trust and leadership and authority in your space. Blogging, B-L-O-G-G-I-N-G, -G -G, blogging still works, but it's not what it used to be. Podcasting, still amazing, but it's more of like a middle bottom of funnel tool than short form video and longer form video. So my best advice, if I like, this is basically what I tell all of my clients is like, we, we need to be looking at YouTube. That, that's it, like full stop. YouTube is going to give you long form video and short form video. With the short form video, you can also multi purpose it, repurpose it to TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, kind of Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest. So, yeah, a lot of, a lot of bang for your buck. Diana, will you still be doing a video tutorial on high level? Oh, Diana, that's this. So, this isn't me, but it's me. So it's um, the founder of High Level went through and did like all of the videos and then I share it. So just as good. So go check that out. That'll give you everything you ever wanted and more about it. Uh, Michael, my pleasure. Obina, <coughs> approaching the end of an hour. My throat's starting to go. I started affiliate marketing since December, 2022. I have not been making sales. Yeah, affiliate marketing is hard. Um, I don't know why or what. It's sort of like, how do I cook a good meal? There's a lot of factors that go in, but affiliate marketing is tricky because you're competing with affiliate marketers who are marketers, uh, like full-time marketers who are hell-bent on eking out every conversion point and uh, percentage increase and optimization. Um, people like me that live and breathe and eat this stuff, like it's just, um, it's tricky. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's not my favorite model. My favorite model is probably content creation with affiliate marketing in, but straight up affiliate marketing, tricky stuff. Uh, Latricia, good morning from East Texas. Good to see you, Latricia. Glad we've got our, our representatives here. Gallo823, so good. The market research video. Thank you. Hola and gracias. Ah, de nada, mi amigo. I'm glad you liked it. And yes, if you haven't I've mentioned this right at the beginning, but that's one of those videos that I think everyone should watch. Like there's often videos that I'll make that I'll be like, yeah, you can watch it if you're interested. I think it'll, it'll help you if you're into this or that or the other thing. This market research video that just went live on the channel, it's not very long, might be 13 minutes, uh, but it will be time well spent. So take a watch, hit the thumbs up, you know, the usual stuff. Leave a comment. I'll say hi. We'll have more of a chat. Uh, Midge Group, we subscribed to you from yesterday. Well, glad to have you along. Glad you could be here. Daniel Jack Barnes. That's a cool profile picture. I like it. Uh, I've just got back into the YouTube game as there's not many people giving info in my field of work, touring, music, uh, photo, videographer. What's one good marketing practice to get eyes on the channel? Cool. Yeah, that is a neat niche. I like it. Um, so let me give you the best advice I can give you that is also the hardest and probably the the worst advice because it's like, it's so hard to do, but like honest, honest to God, the best advice is to try to make the best videos that you possibly can. Right. It's like success on YouTube comes down to a couple different things. Consistency being one, but less important now than it was. The big thing now is a combination of like topic title, thumbnail, and like intro of the video. So you've got to nail the topic. Is this something that people are actually interested in? Next, the title. How do I phrase the title so that it's going to capture the eye and the attention of somebody who would be interested in this? What's the thumbnail that's going to stand out while still be an accurate representation? Well, not be clickbaity, but still be enticing, intriguing enough for someone to click it. And then the intro. How do I basically say what the title and thumbnail are? How do I prove to them that this is a place for them that's worth being? And then how do I sustain that retention through the video? 
So yeah, there's a lot of good things. You know who has the best advice on this is honestly Mr. Beast, uh, Jimmy Donaldson himself. If you watch Mr. Beast's interviews on it, he'll say what I said, but better. Um, it's going to be about better videos. It's going to be about doing everything you can to try to like eke out max performance, etc. cetera. Uh, Hunter, am I still using high level? Yes, I am. Um, I will be using that for until I find a better solution, which has not been for... Um, for years. So yeah, I don't, I don't see leaving that anytime soon. Mason Bourne. First of all, thank you for all the help. My pleasure, buddy. Uh, I'm the solar guy who's been bugging you. Oh, it's not bugging. You're, you're asking good questions. I'm using a marketing company that is getting me $5 leads. It's an ad company, which is extremely good. Should I try to handle the ads myself or just keep using them indefinitely? I would keep using them indefinitely. If they're, if they're delivering you $5 leads, and they're good leads and you're able to convert, I don't know, like let's say the price of a solar company, I know it's more than 500 bucks, but like let's let's do easy math here. If uh, the price of it's 500 bucks and you convert one in 10, um, what is that? 50 bucks per closed sale, $450 profit. And we know like solar panels are going to be 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand, 50 grand. Uh, I priced them out for our house and it was some stupid, stupid high number. So I've yet to, I've yet to do it. I got to bite the bullet at some point. But point of the matter is, yeah, keep using them. Also try to learn them. Just don't replace them. Like, learn what they're doing. Learn how you could do it just in case. I call it the hit by a bus strategy. It's morbid. It's morbid, but it's effective. And essentially, anytime that I have a position or a role or something that my business is reliant on, I'm always scared that they're going to get hit by a bus or quit or leave or do whatever it is, and then I'm stuck. So, yeah, try to find out what they're doing so you can do it, but that doesn't mean you should because if they're doing a good job. All right, let's do a couple more questions, and then I've got a bail. Because it's Saturday, family time. Got to recharge, got to rest, got to do the play. Actually, we're playing Mario Kart today. Okay, Ultimash, how do you edit your videos? They are top quality. There is no doubt you put a lot of effort into these videos. Hats off to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yes, the, the editing process is done uh, by two full-time video editors. So that is not how I started. That is where we're at now. They are phenomenal and talented, genius, amazing people. Uh, so, so we do it that way. We used to use Premiere Pro. We used Final Cut for a while. We are now using DaVinci Resolve exclusively. It is by far my favorite video editor ever. I still like Final Cut a little bit, but DaVinci just beats it in so many ways. Um, most of my time is spent going into ideas and script and outline, thinking of B-roll or skits or raps or whatever else I can do to sort of keep it engaging and interesting rather than me sitting there and be like, all right, today we're talking analytics. Are you ready? It's going to be fun because it's like, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to watch that kind of video. It reminds me of like university and boring college courses that I would do terrible in. So yeah, that's it. And, um, and yeah, the work, we definitely a ton of work, but fun, right? Like really fun. And to get to have this conversation here now and to hear about that they're providing value makes it, uh, makes it encouraging to go back and do more. Okay. Zach, thanks for the tips. Recently been watching, uh, binge watching your content. Awesome. Good man. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Glad you're finding it valuable. All right. Let me see if I can find one more and then we'll run. I watched a vid marketing strategy for Kodiak Cakes, but can you create a specific one on the message? Will help everyone feel more confident serving their first client. Yeah. So I do have a, a video called, I don't know, forget what it's called. Watch me create a complete marketing strategy for a random business from scratch. Something like that, where I went through and did Kodiak cakes because we were eating a lot of Kodiak cakes, pancakes at the time. Um, yes, one on messaging is probably good. The video I have on copywriting might help, so we could probably uh, that'd probably be a good start. Jason, my pleasure, my friend, my pleasure. Okay, let's see if I can find one more. Doo -doo -doo -doo. A lot of questions on finding the ideal avatar. I might have to make a video on that. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Paul, this one will be quick. So I'll, I'll hit it quick. Still waiting on that story. R.E. that guitar. Oh, yeah. I was going to do like a riff or possibly like a, a social media thing of me playing guitar. Maybe later. Um, as far as CRM to use for nurturing leads and acquisition. Yeah. I, high level for me is, is what I personally use. I would look at that one. Um, HubSpot has like an amazing CRM if you're looking at things like that. For like straight up lead gen, I like high level. And what else can we find? Do, do, do. This is funny. How do, I, how do I prove to the greedy boss we need to spend money on software? I'll show the ROI. You've got to show like it's worth it. Like if we spend a hundred bucks on this software, it's going to deliver us $200 worth of value. So we'd be crazy not to. 
Let's see. I like this. Let's see this one. I think this will help. King, hey Adam, my question is that, is it true that a business without marketing is in a dangerous uh, and sitting behind the disc waiting, nothing will happen? So yes, this is basically is like, is it true that a business that's not doing marketing is in a, a dangerous position? And the answer is yes, 100%. So marketing is, in my view, and after having, at first I said this out of what my gut thought, and now I can say it out of um, experience and having worked with well over a thousand companies, is that marketing is the single most important element to your business success. Because if nobody knows who you are, they can't buy from you. If nobody knows why they should care, they won't buy from you. If, um, if you're not doing anything to control the narrative and what's being said about your brand and business, they're saying it about you and you don't have any control, which means that um, they might not buy from you too. So it's like, you've, you've got to take control. And if you're not doing marketing, you're still doing marketing. It's just bad marketing or not marketing, unmarketing, we could call it, where other people are creating the things for you. You're losing money to your competitors. Also, when's the best time to do marketing? All the time, right? Because like when you're, when you're not busy, it's too late, right? Because then you scramble and you start making bad decisions. You start investing in platforms and channels, kind of like Hail Marys, dumping money into ads that you don't have and you can't afford for them to fail. Like, it's a, it's a slippery slope downhill. The saddest email I get by far, the saddest email. And, and the point that I, unfortunately I can't help much is Adam, my business is failing. I've got no money left. I don't know what to do. You're my only hope. And if I'm your only hope at that point, it's like, well, we, we don't have the runway. We like, we need time. We need time to create content. We need time to develop materials, to put them out, to establish goodwill. We can't just show up on the scene, expect everybody to love us, um, and expect to last. Like that's, that's just not how it works. So yes, I feel very passionate, very strongly about this subject. It's very important. Now, however you define marketing, I'm not suggesting you need to be on all the social media platforms, doing all of the things all the time, creating all of the content. Yes, there is that extreme of marketing you could pursue, but it is not necessary. It's probably not even helpful. You're much better off to be strategic and calculated, think things through, do the right things in the right place for the right people, which is kind of the goal of this whole channel, this chat here. So, whew, that was it. All right, everyone. Thank you for being here. Great questions. As usual, it was good to see all of your happy, beautiful, smiling faces. And um, and uh, definitely my final call to action, go check out that market research video. And uh, we'll catch you in the next video or on the next live stream or in the comment section below. All right, talk soon.